Hello and welcome to Physician Focus, a production of the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin, your host for this program. In recent years, the medical community has learned a lot about concussions, what causes them, what the impact is, and importantly, how to treat patients who have had a concussion. Because of this new information, many of our approaches to care have changed. Today, you'll hear from a pediatric emergency room physician about the most up-to-date medical approaches to concussion. And you'll also hear the inspiring story of a brain injury survivor, as well as an advocate who's trying to spread the word about how to prevent and respond to concussion and other traumatic brain injuries. First, I sat down at the Massachusetts Medical Society headquarters with Dr. Theodore Macnow from UMass Memorial Healthcare in order to better understand traumatic brain injury and concussion. Well, Ted Macnow, thank you for joining us here at the Mass Medical Society Library. Uh, we're going to talk on one of your favorite subjects. Uh, you as a uh, pediatric emergency specialist have run into a few cases of concussion. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Well, let's start with some basics. What is a concussion? How do I know I've had one? So a concussion is a temporary disturbance of your thinking. Um, and it, it, in different people, it can be all sorts of symptoms. So it can be anything from headache to dizziness to I'm not just feeling right to um, trouble thinking, emotional disturbances. So you don't actually have to pass out for it to be a concussion. Correct. Actually, most concussions do not have a loss of consciousness. So in other words, you, you, you get hit on the head or you uh, fall or something and then afterwards you have this disturbance and, and you're being very vague because it is very vague? It is, and if you think about it, the brain controls all areas of your body, so depending on what part of your brain you injure, you could have any sort of symptom. Basically, so, what, we, what we think a concussion is, is that there's a temporary disturbance to how the cells in your brain function, that they get leaky and kind of leak out all this potassium, and it, it takes a while for the brain to heal that and repair the cells, and while it's working to repair the cells, you have some persistent symptoms. So it's sort of amazing that the brain does this every night. That's what sleep is for and all that. Uh, but uh, you're saying that even a small minor disturbance will have a manifestation that you, you can see, you know, uh, it's not, not working right today. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be all there is to a concussion. So uh, how do we get that to heal? Well, we think the best way to heal a concussion is at the moment is to sort of take yourself out of commission. It's like if you injured your shoulder, you have some swelling of your shoulder, you're going to put it in a sling and rest it. At the moment, what we're thinking is the best way to heal a concussion is to rest your brain. And so if you have a concussion, you want to take yourself out of school or out of work, you want to not participate in exercise, at least for a couple of days. And then after that, there's a gradual sort of return to your normal life, which in kids, which is my area of expertise, will be a gradual return to school, then to sort of light exercise, then more moderate exercise, working up to fully participating in sports. So how quickly does that happen? What is the, the general time course, and how do I know how to progress? It's different in different people. Most concussions, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent, will resolve within the first 7 to 10 days, but some concussions can have symptoms that persist for weeks or even for months. How do you, you know, it, it's like in some of those ads, they say, call your doctor if. Yeah. And how does a doctor know, geez, he's progressed to the next stage? Mm -hmm. What things do you use to mark the sure. uh, improvement? As an emergency room doctor, my job is very easy, which is that I say, tomorrow I want you to do nothing. If you have no symptoms, I want you to go to school the next day. And if you still have no symptoms, you're probably okay. If you go back to school, you're having symptoms, or you have symptoms the next day, I want you to follow up with the pediatrician. And then it's really between sort of the patient and their primary care doctor as far as how they're progressing in terms of their symptoms and, and how quickly that return back to normal activity is. Uh, there are some old saws about, uh, well, if you get a concussion, keep them up. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there any uh, truth to that, or is that uh, something that we need to put to rest, as it were. The, uh, the old adage of, of sort of not sleeping if you have a concussion, that, that sort of comes from 
back in the day. Uh, yeah. We didn't exactly know so how to predict. My year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not mine. Yeah. Uh, it, it, how do we predict if someone has a head bleed, which is something that we would be really concerned about and, and would need you know, potential surgery in order to deal with? And so we didn't want people necessarily to sleep after an injury because we want to be able to monitor them carefully. Now we have great rules for predicting whether someone has a head bleed and actually have great risk factors for knowing sort of how high the risk is for a head bleed. And if the risk is high enough, we can always get a CAT scan to rule that out. And so now if we say we feel confident you don't have a head bleed, but you may have a concussion, we want you to sleep as much as possible and, and rest your brain. Because that's where you do a lot of the restorative work and the repair work is during sleep. Correct. And, we, and our thinking is that if you're not challenging the brain and making it work too hard, it's able to heal itself faster. What would you say um, to a parent who's worried about the, um, the consequences? All right, uh, Johnny just uh, was, uh, fell on the school lot, uh, knocked his head, and uh, um, uh, garbled his words for a few minutes afterwards, but seems okay. What do you say to that parent? What, what's the long-term consequences of this concussion? I would try to be reassuring. Concussions, by definition, usually everyone totally heals, come back to your normal baseline, is sort of a temporary disturbance, and then they're all better. I think that there can be some consequences while you're suffering the symptoms of the concussion. If they try to go to school and you're trying to push through symptoms, the grades you get may not reflect their actual abilities. If you try to, you know, you got to take the SATs this Saturday, you have a concussion, but just try to take the SATs, you may not get the score that you want. <laughs> it may not work. Well, um, so you're also implying that uh, there's a compounding of problems if you work through the, uh, the concussion and, you know, say re-injure. That's where we get into trouble is if you do repeated injuries with a yeah. concussion aboard? I, I think there's two separate things. First, if you try to push through a concussion and, and you're having severe symptoms as you're trying to either think too hard or, or exercise through the concussion, it may prolong the symptoms of the concussion. There's also this entity of sort of multiple concussions and someone who gets a concussion is at a highest risk for another concussion while they're still healing from that first concussion. And the consequences to that can be a more prolonged recovery and then in, in rare circumstances, there may be some actual real tragedies if you get a, another concussion on top of a concussion. So it's sort of like your sports injury. If you, uh, if you twist your ankle and then try to run on it, uh, it's likely that uh, th that's when you get the, the next sprain, which is really the bad one. Sure. You, you, you twist your ankle, your mechanics are off, and then you hurt your other knee. Another mm -hmm. way to think about it is if you're trying to play sports through a concussion, maybe you're not as sharp, maybe you're not as quick, you get blindsided playing football, or you know, you'll, you'll lose the puck and you're skating with your head down and you get hit from the front. So we think that athletes are at a higher risk for sustaining a concussion if they're not functioning at their peak ability. So the, the, the recent rules in a lot of the professional sports with you get a head injury, you're, you're out until uh, we've taken it the next step, really make a, a great deal of sense. Correct. There's some newer research which actually suggests that sort of holding people back and being very slow with their recovery may not be the best approach. We all seem to agree that shutting down at least for a couple days is the way to go, but newer research seems to be suggesting that maybe you want to do some moderate exercise and, and um, moderate return to school before you're fully healed. And you could sort of see that if you have a kid and you're saying, stay at home, you know, let me know how your symptoms are. If they're just sitting in a room, looking at nothing, thinking about whether they have a headache, are they giving themselves a headache? We call that the nocebo effect. Okay. Um, or are we sort of giving them depression because we're taking them away from their friends and taking them away from their activities? And is, is sort of letting them come back sooner uh, potentially going to going to help their symptoms and help them recover from the concussion sooner. So maybe letting them uh, play their video game if it doesn't uh, tire them out, or is that a, yeah. an iffy uh, kind the of... Scre the screen time, I think, is, is controversial, and there's not a whole lot of research behind it. What I say to my patients is, I'm okay with you sitting at home and watching stupid movies if you're not thinking too hard and the light of the television isn't bothering your eyes. Yeah. Most of us seem to think that video games or, or texting a lot on the phone it, maybe sort of too much mental energy much for a country, oh. but um, 
there's no research really to support that. Would you let your son play football? If he wanted to play football, I, I think that the value of sports in kids in terms of learning about exercise and, and lifelong exercise habits and teamwork and keeping them out of trouble uh, far outweigh the risks of concussions. Concussions have always been there. Um, we're recognizing them more, which is good because now we know how to treat them and, and let kids heal from them. But um, I think that if he got a couple concussions, I'd reevaluate it, but I'd let him play football if he wanted to play football. We've only got a couple minutes left, believe it or not. Okay. And in that time, I'd, I'd like to just see if we could recap the, the high points of uh, what you want to tell us. So first off, let's make sure everybody knows what a concussion is. So a concussion is, is a disturbance to your brain, which is a temporary brain injury. There's no structural damage. So if we were to do a CAT scan, it's normal. But, but functionally, your brain's not working as well, but it's temporary and you should recover completely. And that includes any of these mental disturbances of a wide variety. Uh, just you're, you're not quite functioning right. You may have a little headache. Dizziness, uh, uh, ringing in your ears, you know, being a little off balance, lights bothering my eyes. You know, when I walk, I, I kind of feel a little unsteady. It, it can be any of these symptoms and more. Recovery, you're saying at least a day? It's hard because in the moment we don't have a good predictor for, for whether you have a concussion or not. We really only know based on the persistence of symptoms. So to be on the safe side, I think you take yourself out of commission for a day or two, which would be the treatment for a concussion. And then depending on how severe your symptoms are, you're, you, know, you either make a very quick return back to your normal activities or you're out for longer. Well, thank you very much. This has been uh, very informative and uh, it's a delight to have uh, Dr. Ted Macnow here from UMass. Oh, well, thank you and so much for having me. As Dr. Macnow makes clear, concussions can be serious, but they are also treatable. But what happens when a patient survives a serious traumatic brain injury? Our correspondent, Lucy Barrington, sat down with Ryan Farrell, a young woman from Eastern Massachusetts, to hear how her injury impacted her life. Ryan Farrell, a few years ago, you were a young woman from Hopedale in Eastern Massachusetts with a very traditionally bright future. You were in your first year of college. You were looking at your career options. You were enjoying yourself socially. In fact, as you put it, your life was nearly perfect. Then something happened to change that. So thank you for joining us today to talk about that event, how it affected the next few years of your life, and what we can learn from it. Well, for starters, thank you and your crew so much for coming over to the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts, or my second home, as I always refer to it as, and really giving the appropriate and necessary attention to what is more often called the invisible, the invisible injury, traumatic brain injury and concussion. Tell us what happened to you. Well, I was finishing up my freshman year of college, and I was, like you already um, mentioned, very involved with all sorts of activities and organizations. But I was a member of our cheerleading team, and uh, we were performing at a fundraising exhibition at the local mall. And I was one of the bases, so one of the girls on the bottom side of the stunt holding the flyer up in a stunt above my head. And our flyer suddenly bailed out of the stunt and fell to the side. Um, and I, her rear end hit me in my chest, causing me to fall back down to my own rear end. And I did not receive the immediate proper medical attention, which any injury requires, and was instead encouraged to continue performing. So um, I did, and a short time later I collapsed and did not regain consciousness. Um, so I was then rushed to the, uh, local, the local hospital, which, thank God, was right back up the street. And um, I underwent emergency surgery. Um, I was in a medically induced coma for two weeks, a total of one month in the ICU. And it was after that month that I was transferred to um, Spalding Rehab Hospital right here in Boston to begin all of my inpatient therapies. What was your initial recovery like? 
What did it consist of? Rough, <laughs> to put it quite bluntly. Well, uh, when I first started at Swathing, the head physiatrist called the meeting with my parents and basically told them that I was so severely injured that mm -hmm. I would, at the very best, be only, only ever be able to walk with a walker. And I would be very limited with all other aspects of my life. And so I, I had to relearn how to do everything. All the things you learn, we learn how to do in preschool and kindergarten, such as brushing your teeth, um, washing your hands, um, taking very guarded. Um, I was in a wheelchair for all of my 11 weeks there and um, was again, very limited with any of my physical um, actions. And then finally, um, at the beginning of August, I was moved to Crotchet Mountain Rehab Center up in New Hampshire for the last step of my inpatient rehab. Mm -hmm. And that last step certainly lived up to, lived up to what I'm calling it because I arrived there and I made tremendous strides, both physically, cognitively, um, occupationally, and even emotionally too. From this point, you're several years down the road. Yeah, I, I just, seven years. just celebrated my seventh birthday um, just the other day, actually. Happy rebirth day. Yeah, thank you. How would you say at this point that, the, that this accident affected your life? The thing with brain injuries, and that the thing we, the main, one of the main messages we try to really hammer home uh, when presenting is that it's not like a broken arm or a um, sprained ankle or anything like that. You can't just strap a cast on it and then go to a certain amount of physical therapy sessions and then be all better, good as new. Right. Um, a brain injury affects you for your entire life. I mean, you can keep getting better and keep improving, but you'll never be completely healed from a traumatic brain injury. So that, it still affects me. Like I need, I need reminders from my mom or my sister or anyone else. Um, it takes me a lot longer to get ready um, for my day, whether it's like the physical aspect of it or gathering all of my stuff mm -hmm. and making sure I have everything all set. And um, I returned to college, like I said, graduated only one year behind, but I graduated in 20, 2014 and I, I still don't have a job. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I volunteer and I work through the Brain Injury Association, like I said, but I'm still still on that oh-so-ferocious right. hunt for my big kid real world job. I mean, despite these challenges that you've obviously handled yeah. with, you know, warmth and energy and this, um, this impressive spirit Thank and you. all of those cliches really, <laughs> but they're all true. Thank you. Um, what would you, wh where do you think that resilience comes from in your case? I think it just comes from the fact that I never had, like in my whole life growing up, I never, I never allowed anyone or anything to get in my way. So I wasn't about to start start allowing that when push really came to shove. It's you either you either get better or you get bitter. And I I chose to pull a dory and just keep <laughs> swimming, just keep swimming. It's great. You work very hard to educate the public about brain injury. Yes. What is the most important thing that we need to know? I think, and there are so many important things, but I think if I had to narrow down to just the most important thing is that brain injury, brain injuries can happen anytime, any place, to anyone. And it's, it's up to not only the individual, but the bigger, the bigger team as a whole, whether it's your athletic team or your coworkers or anything like that, 
it's all, it's up to every single person involved in that setting to prevent because that's the only way that brain injuries can be um, stopped or fixed or whatever you want to call it starts with prevention and then everything else fo follows suit but so it sounds like it's a matter of when there's an incident knowing to stop yes and assess mm -hmm. and then follow the appropriate protocol exactly. to prevent damage exactly great that's and like i said when we present our programs that is one of the biggest and most paramount messages we we try to um, push right. through right. is that they are so preventable. Well, thank you. You've put out that message today, and we very much appreciate it. All good wishes. Well, thank you so much. We also met with Justine Cote of the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts to hear about the work that organization is doing to educate the public about preventing and responding to concussions and traumatic brain injuries. Justine Cote, you are Manager of Prevention at the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts. Thank you for being here with us. First, can you help us understand the overlap between concussion and traumatic brain injury? Are these two terms for the same thing? I think it's very important to understand that a concussion is in fact a brain injury. In the past, I think there has been some misconceptions about tr concussion, certainly, that it was not a brain injury, something a little bit different. Uh, certainly there's variations of brain injury and concussions, and I think that you know the misconception comes from that there's a particular person on a, on a soccer field that might have a two to three week recovery versus someone that might have post-concussive sy symptoms afterward, and it might resonate for three to four months. It, it, it varies for every single person. And what we often say at the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts is that when you've seen one brain injury, you've seen just one brain injury. So. Uh, yes, I think it is important to um, tell the public that a concussion is in fact a brain injury. Why is it important for all of us to understand concussion and traumatic brain injury? I think it's imperative that the public knows about brain injury because it is not a well-known injury. It's a silent injury. You might look okay on the outside, you may be different on the inside, and it happens so often. It happens every 13 seconds a brain injury is sustained in the United States. So I think that education on brain injury is important. Education equals awareness. What would you like parents to know about concussion and traumatic brain injury? I think it also piggybacks off the last question that we just um, talked about is that be realistic about the injury and that your son or daughter may be a little different. They may look okay and similar to who they were on the outside, but inside they may have changed. And to be patient with your son or daughter that, about these changes and help them through that. And how they can do that is with, it might not just be at the home. You might need to leave the doctor's office and extend outwards to other organizations like the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts. We're here to help. And certainly our INR specialists, our information and resource specialists are standing by and certainly they can help you not feel alone. We have support groups several around the state that can um, make you feel, have a sense of unity in terms of other families that have dealt with the same thing and, and with rec activities um, have a feeling of um, uh, inclusion and in, in not feeling alone in brain injury. Thank you. I'm sure that community is key to recovery for the um, individual and their family. Absolutely. Thank you, Justine, for being here and uh, helping us talk about this today. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to bringing you new perspectives on health care issues that impact us all on future episodes of Physician Focus, brought to you by the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. See you next time.
I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines, and when taken under a doctor's supervision, provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Frank McMillan. And I'm Dr. Raj Devarajan. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, claiming more than 50,000 lives each year. The cancer occurs in the colon and rectum, parts of the large intestine, and is caused by growths called polyps that can turn into cancer. Screening for colorectal cancer saves lives, but 23 million American adults, about one in three, don't get screened as recommended. Colorectal cancer affects men and women, and the, high, and the risk rises with age and a family history of the disease. If you're over 50 or have a family history of the disease, early screening is recommended. Screening can reduce the risk of colon colorectal cancer by up to 90% by finding and removing the growths before they turn into cancer. For more information on colorectal cancer and the different screening tests available, visit the American College of Gastroenterology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Goodman. Raising a happy, healthy child is every parent's priority. When your child has a fever or is injured, it's easy for parents to seek medical attention. It's not so easy when kids don't want to do homework or engage at school, are withdrawn or cranky, and tough to connect with, all of which could be normal or could be signs of mental illness. Mental health problems such as ADHD, depression, and anxiety are common among children and youth. In children, these problems often look different than they do in adults. So it's important that parents be aware of warning signs that can indicate mental health problems. Look for relationship problems with peers or family members, trouble fulfilling responsibilities like homework and daily chores, a drop in school performance, or mood changes that last for weeks. If you observe any of these signs, talk with your child's pediatrician. For more information, visit the American Academy of Pediatrics at healthychildren.org. I'm Dr. Jerry Goodman. And I'm Dr. John Mandeville. Age-related eye diseases such as cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy affect nearly 37 million Americans. With an aging population and higher rates of conditions like diabetes, the number of visually impaired people is expected to increase substantially in the years ahead. While age may bring on vision disorders, many conditions are preventable, and everyone at any age should take steps to maintain good eye health. Here's what you can do. Get regular screenings to check for potential problems. Take care of your overall health, know your family history, and be alert to health and vision changes that could be signs of something serious. Wear eye protection when needed, at work, playing sports, or working at home with tools, including sunglasses to guard against damaging rays from the sun. For more information on eye health and protecting your vision, visit GetEyeSmart.org.